Good morning. It's time for us to begin. So we'll please take a Bible and open it to the book of Ezekiel. We're going to look at several passages from the book of Ezekiel to get us started this morning. Uh, these are texts that we looked at right at the end of class last week. And so we want to wrap up some thoughts from that and then continue our study of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to spend some time in the Old Testament. And then if we have time, uh, we will move our attention or shift our attention to a study of the Holy Spirit in the Gospels, which ironically is probably the most straightforward of all the sections of Scripture uh, as it relates to the work of the Holy Spirit. Now again, it's one of those things where there's a lot about it that we're going to have to say, now how did that happen? Eh, we don't know. But as far as what the Spirit did, the text is very, very explicit, and there's not a whole lot of room uh, for, for variance or even discussion about that. So pretty much when we talk about the Holy Spirit in the Gospels, we'll just go verse by verse by verse and just here it is, here it is, here it is. Uh, but before we do that, we need to finish up some thoughts from our study of the Old Testament, and so that's what we're going to start with uh, this morning. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our study. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the day. Thank you for all the blessings we have, and we're thankful for the time that we have at the start of this week to come and open up your word and to study it with an open mind and an open heart. And we pray that some of the things that we say will give us strength, give us courage, give us perhaps the ability to serve you better in the future than we have in the past. Father, we ask you to be with those who are not with us. We have those who have just gone through surgeries and procedures and are recovering from that. We have others who are uh, dealing with other physical infirmities. We have uh, brethren who are traveling all over the place right now. We just pray you'd keep them safe if it be your will. And uh, Father, we have others who are, who are not here because the choice was made for them to be somewhere else or to do something different. We just pray that you would give them strength, that something might be said or done, that would cause them to think about the course of action they're taking in life, that they might uh, correct that before it be eternally too late. Father, be with us. Forgive us of our sins, and we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So as we were studying the texts about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, we were introduced to what I called really our first tension. Uh, and that is the tension that exists between divine provision and human endeavor. Or another way of saying that is how much of it is God and how much of it is us. Now, there are some in the religious world who say it's all God. The Calvinists believe that, that we have no control over anything. That's a false extreme. There are others who say, well, God's not really involved at all. It's all on us, which is also a false extreme. And that's all I was trying to point out at the end of class. As we think about the work of the Spirit or the work of God or the work of the Christ, we need to recognize that that work does exist. We cannot always know all of the details about that work, but to deny its existence is a denial of what the text says. And so I pointed out passages like Ecclesi or excuse me, Ezekiel chapter 11, Ezekiel chapter 11 and verse 19. It says, "I will give them one heart, and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. And so in this passage, it is very explicit that God is the one at work. Then you go over to Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 31, it says, Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed, and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? And so in this text, it is mankind that is at work. And then you go to Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26. 
And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And so again, we have divine intervention or divine provision, we might say. And so what I want to use all of these texts, if you just pull one out, the one you like, to make your point, well, that's not really, that's not really good biblical exegesis and study. And so what you've got to do is you've got to use all of these passages together to get the full picture. That's called a systematic approach to Bible study. And so when you take all of these passages, here are your two takeaways. We have roles and responsibilities. That is 100% true. That has always been true. That was true in the Old Testament. That is true in the time of the New Testament. And that is true today. No one is denying that. But at the same time, we also see from these passages that God is at work. And that's the point I was trying to make. And we see this in the New Testament as well. In the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, we see this same tension. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That is human endeavor, for it is God who works in you. That is God's divine uh, provision. And I do believe that God provides abilities, talents, and those sorts of things. Now, how do we build on our God-given gifts and abilities? You study. That's exactly right. You know just as well as I do, some of the most talented people in the world don't always live up to that potential and ability because they're not willing to put in the time and the effort and the discipline that it takes to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so as we think about that, all I want to leave you with is we have a responsibility. But we also, after we've done everything we can do, we depend on God. And I do believe that comes through the Spirit. And so we see that. Now, here's kind of where we left it. I used an illustration, and I said that I um, have been in places, I've been in situations where you know, I was prepared, I had studied, and then you know, a situation happened, and you just, you just don't know, we can't always explain that fully. And I think most of you knew what I was talking about or identified with that because several of you came up after the class and said that something similar had happened to you. With that said, what I want to do is clarify because others were concerned that that statement could be taken to an extreme. Essentially, the idea is that if you say God speaks to you, which is not the language I use, but if you say that, then someone else could come along a year from now, five years from now, ten years from now, and say God speaks to me, and God's speaking something that's not right. And that really leads us to this next point which is how do you know? And so whether you believe that the Lord does that, whether you believe that he doesn't, at the end of the day, it comes back to this. What does the word say? What does the word say? <clears throat> and so as we think about that, the idea of whether this comes through my own study or whether this comes through the work of the Spirit, at the end of the day, if it's something that is said that goes against the Word, then we know that's not from God. That's the test. And that's what I want to do as we look at the text today. I want to go to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Now again, we're looking at this in the context of the Old Testament. And so when we talk about the prophetic work of the Spirit, 
I do believe there is a distinction between what the Spirit did with the Old Testament prophets and what the Spirit does now. Okay, Because when the Spirit was speaking to the prophets and giving them revelation, where else were they getting that? Where, where else would they have gotten that revelation from? That's a trick question. They wouldn't have, okay? Because there was not written revelation like there is now. A lot of their work and the revelation which was given by the Spirit was for the purpose of giving us what we have today, okay? So I do believe there is a distinction. But what does the text say about the work of the prophets in 2 Peter chapter 1? 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Peter here writing, and he says, Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, who is Peter talking about there? Okay, I think he's talking about... You're right, you... You, you gave me point B. I will, let's get point A and then we'll get to you. Okay, so I do believe he's talking about Old Testament prophecy. But this is where there's a little bit of bleed over, okay? And, and R.D. is exactly right. I don't want you to think that we're ju when you see prophecy, our minds go immediately to the Old Testament, but it's not always Old Testament prophecy, okay? The work of the apostles in the New Testament and those who wrote down the revealed word that is also prophetic work, okay? So we've got, pro the New Testament talks a lot about prophets. Talks about true prophets, talks about false prophets. Um, in fact, the very next verse, not a very good chapter break, but chapter 2, verse 1, false prophets also arose among the people just as there will be false teachers among you. So the idea there uh, bleeds over. But where does prophecy come from? There's only one source. Now, the difference between Old Testament prophecy and New Testament prophecy is not the source, but the method of delivery. Okay? How was prophecy delivered in the Old Testament? A lot of times God spoke directly. That's exactly right. How was prophecy delivered in New Testament? Okay. So I want you to see that. 2 Peter chapter 1. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul basically makes the same point. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. <clears throat> and this goes again to what R.D. just said. We are talking about Old Testament prophecy. We're also talking about the work of the apostles and other New Testament writers. Paul talks about himself here in, sec in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 10. These things... God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We could really camp out here and look at this whole passage in context. But I just want to pull that and show you that one point. Peter says, where does revelation come from? The Spirit Paul says, where does revelation come from? The Spirit. And then, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, this may be a passage you can quote. Paul writes to Timothy and he says, All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God <clears throat> and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Now, some of you, your versions may translate that slightly different. So I used the word inspired, which I think we understand what that means. Some of your versions use a different terminology. What do they say? Breathed out. Now, let's just rewind and go back to the very first class three or four weeks ago. What did we say? The word for spirit also means wind or breath. Okay, you see that connection there? 
Okay, and so when we come here and it talks about inspired, that is literally meaning that it is breathed out. So that indicates that the Spirit would be involved. And so all of these passages show us, they show us the prophetic work of the Holy Spirit. Now, who is Paul talking about in this text? Now, the other texts, I think you could make the argument, those are, those are talking about the apostles as well as Old Testament prophets. But who's Paul talking about in 2, Corinthians, or 2 Timothy 3? Look at verse 15. Second Timothy 3 and verse 15. Yeah, if somebody wants to read it, we sure can. Okay, so when it talks about the Holy Scriptures or the sacred writings that Timothy has known from his youth, that's pointing us back to the prophecies of the Old Testament. And then he says, the, but, but what is Paul saying? What were those things written for? What was the purpose? To bring us to a faith in Jesus, to point us forward to faith in Jesus. So I want you to see that. Even if we're talking about Old Testament prophecy, there's a purpose and that purpose is to get us to Jesus. Now, these are all claims that are made by New Testament writers. And they are speaking of themselves and they are speaking of those who had come before them. It is interesting, and I noticed this in my study, <clears throat> you rarely find such direct claims from the prophets of the Old Testament. Now, I want you to think about why that might be. Now, I don't know for sure. I'm going to give you a possibility. I want you to think about this. But I want you to, I want you to think, why do you think that these prophets in the Old Testament were not as direct about their claims as these New Testament writers? Now, there are a couple of instances. Let me just uh, take you to a couple of passages in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 48, Isaiah chapter 48 and verse 16. What does Isaiah say? If someone would just read that, whoever gets there first. Isaiah 48 verse 16. Okay, so what is that claim? Pretty direct, right? The, God has sent me and His Spirit. So these are the words that are coming from the Spirit, according to Isaiah. And then I want you to notice in the book of Micah, Micah chapter 3, I'll read this one, Micah chapter 3 and verse 8, But as for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and might, to declare to Jacob his transgression, and to Israel his sin. So the Old Testament prophets on occasion make such a direct claim. To my knowledge, these are the only two passages where you're going to see Old Testament prophets directly say that their work was coming through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That doesn't happen a lot. Now here's why I believe that is the case. What else did you have going on in the days of the Old Testament prophets? You've got the real prophets, but what else do you have a whole lot of? You've got a lot of false prophets. And what was the very first thing the false prophets were saying? We're from God, right? And so we're going to look at this here in just a little bit. But if you'll go back to the text there in Micah, Micah chapter 3. We read verse 8, but I want you to look at verses 5 through 7. Verses 5 through 7. 
Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray, who cry peace when they have something to eat, but declare war against him who puts nothing into their mouths. Therefore it shall be night to you without vision and darkness to you without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets and the day shall be black over them. The seers shall be disgraced and the diviners put to shame. They shall all cover their lips for there is no answer from God. And so the Lord here is talking about the false prophets and he says because of all of their deception, he says, I'm going to go dark, which we know indicates a lack of any revelation from God. And you see that uh, throughout uh, the Old Testament. Let me give you just one more example of this in 1 Kings chapter 22. 1 Kings chapter 22. 1 Kings chapter 22, we've been talking a lot about Ahab. And we know about Ahab and his poor decisions. We know about Ahab and his wife Jezebel. But one of the things that Ahab did, and I think one of the reasons that he spiraled into an increased amount of ungodliness is because he had people coming in and telling him he was fine throughout all of that. And let's look at one example of this. 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 24. Verse 24. It says, Then Zedekiah the son of Kenaiah came near and struck Micaiah on the cheek and said, how did the Spirit of the Lord go from me to speak to you? And contextually here, what's happening is that a lying spirit has been put in the mouth of all the prophets. So you've got real prophets and you've got false prophets and you've got these false prophets claiming to speak for God and you've got real prophets speaking for God. Okay, so let's take the word prophet out of it and let's just say it this way. You got false teachers claiming to speak for God and you got real teachers claiming to speak for God. Does that sound familiar to you? We have a little bit of that going on in the world today? Right, exactly. So how do you know? How do you distinguish between the two? That's what we're going to spend some time with. Go ahead, Brent. I think there still is today. Yes, I'm just saying that it's not the end. I would agree with that. But at the end of the day, how do you distinguish between the two? Because you also had the guys in the days of Pharaoh who could make frogs and all this kind of stuff. So there's some of that witchcraft and divinity that you got to think about too. So I'm, I'm with you. Let's come back to that. Go ahead. Pharaoh went over to see what the Lord said. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Good. Good deal. Go ahead. Yeah, and I would agree with that. I'm not the one who brought miracles up. Bryn is. <laughs> so, just so you know. Go ahead. I just think the difference that I see in this 
That's what I was wanting to see. That's where I was wanting to see. I get where you're saying. I get what y'all are saying. But at the end of the day, how do you know? It goes back to the word. And that's what we said at the beginning of class. Yes, sir. Exactly. That's what I want us to get back to, is that we can have variations of views on these issues. And we can talk about the old law and the new law. And certainly there were differences. But I, I'm, I, I concern myself sometimes that we immediately go to the differences and, well, they, you know, they had this and we don't. And we miss the fact that at the end of the day, it wasn't the miracles. It was still the Word of God, my friends and brethren, which was the underlying root, principle, foundation of everything that was said and done. Yes, the miracles were there to confirm, but at the end of the day, how do you know someone is right? You've got to see what happened. You've got to see what was fulfilled. It goes back to the Word. That's what I want us to see. Well, we've already talked about that. Could it be because of the numerous false prophets in their day? Here's what I want you to see. This is the point. We've gone a long ways around to make this point, but that's okay. Because we've learned some other things along the way. We have got to test the spirits. Okay? Now, I recognize that that language we may be a little bit un un uncomfortable with or we may not use that. I totally understand that. And in, that, in the sense that there were spirits that we read about in the Scripture, I don't think we have that today. But what we do have, let's take the word prophet out, let's take the word spirit out, let's use our word that we do have, teachers. How do you know if someone is a real teacher or a false teacher? You've got to take it back. To the word you've got to take it back to the word because as has been mentioned we're not going to have miracles that accompany the lesson we're not going to have a lot of these physical manifestations that accompany the lesson but what we do have is the word and so how do we know if someone is teaching the truth we measure it against the word. Now that's language we use a lot in our fellowship. You hear preachers say, now if I'm wrong, you'd be my best friend. Well, do we really mean that? Or we say, you know, we pray that we will take these things and test them against your word. Do we really do that? Or do we just say, well, you know, Brother Bill, he would never lead us wrong. Yes, sir. Absolutely, yeah. 
And that's why it's so important that we do know the text for ourselves. I want you to go to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. We'll look at a few passages here, all of which are going to make the same basic point. Jeremiah chapter 23, this is not on the screen. You could really read the whole chapter because it all makes the same point. But I just want to pull this down to a couple of verses. Let's look at verses 30 through 32. 30 through 32. I think this goes hand in hand with what Brother Tony was just mentioning. Because what do you see? Jeremiah 23 Verse 30, Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who steal my words from one another. I love that language because that's exactly what he's saying. You know, they're, they're not blatantly, you know, but they're just taking it and they're kind of doing this kind of number to it. Yeah. Peter talks about that. He talks about those who twist the scriptures to their own destruction. Behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who use their tongues and declare, declares the Lord. He says, you need to be really careful when you say, this comes from God. Well, does it really come from God? Behold, I am against those who prophesy lying dreams, declares the Lord, and who tell them and lead my people astray by their lies and their recklessness when I did not send them or charge them, so they do not profit this people at all, declares the Lord the Lord. You see this same language throughout the book of Ezekiel. Right. Sure. Well, it goes back to the illustration we used at the beginning of class a few weeks ago. We see something that's wrong, and so our, our immediate reaction is to take the pendulum and go to the opposite extreme rather than actually doing a systematic study. Ezekiel chapter 13, Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 3, Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. So they say, we've seen all of this, we know all of this, the Lord is telling us all of this. But in reality, they are following their own spirit. And he talks about the destruction that comes as a result of that. And then in Micah chapter 2, Micah chapter 2, verse 6, beginning, <clears throat> it says, Do not preach, thus they preach. One should not preach of such things, disgrace will not overtake us. That's essentially preaching what people want you to preach. Now, does that go on today? Absolutely that goes on today. Now go down, if you will, to verse 11. If a man should go about and utter wind and lies, saying, I will preach to you of wine and strong drink, he would be the preacher for this people, telling them what they want to hear. So again, how do you know? Go to Matthew chapter 7, please. Matthew chapter 7. What does Jesus say? Matthew chapter 7. I want you to look at verse 16. If someone would read, Josh, if you would read Matthew chapter 7, verse 16. And keep your Bible open there. Okay, so how are you going to know? Got to inspect the fruit. That's exactly right. Now, what's he talking about? Will you read verse 15? Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Okay, he's talking about false prophets contextually here. And he says, by their fruits you'll know them. That's what I want you to see. And so it takes... It takes some examination. Sometimes it takes some time to know. Um, and so I just want to look at a few things with you. This will probably be where we wrap up. How could you tell, in the Old Testament, how could you tell if someone was a false prophet? <clears throat> now, at the root of all of it, it had to go back to the Word. Okay? What I want you to see, 
The application that I want us to make in today's class is that yes, they had miracles, yes, things were different, but ultimately, the way they spotted a false prophet is the same way we spot a false teacher today. Okay? You test it against the Word. There are some other manifestations that you can also see. Here's the first one. How do you know someone's a false prophet? Well, they're just not a very good person. So, they're not even good Israelites, let alone good prophets. Let's look at a few examples. Go, if you will, to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 28. Let's just look at some of the nonsense and tomfoolery that some of these prophets were engaging in. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 28, verses 7 and 8. Just listen to this imagery. I want you to picture this in your mind. What does this look like to you? Isaiah 28, beginning verse 7. These also reel with wine and stagger with strong drink. Okay, so they haven't just had one or two. The priest and the prophet reel with strong drink. They are swallowed up by wine. They stagger with strong drink. They reel in vision. They stumble in giving judgment. For all tables are full of filthy vomit with no space left. All right, so you just picture what that's looking like in your mind. What's going on here? They're, they're, yeah, exactly. How am I going to give you good judgment? I'm over here staggering drunk. So they're engaged in all kinds of immorality, including drunkenness. Go, if you will, to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. And just so you know, I, I don't know that that passage is used to preach or teach against drunkenness, but I think it would be a pretty good one to use. You might want to add that to your list the next time somebody wants to have that conversation with you. All right, Jeremiah chapter 23. Let's look at verse 14. Jeremiah 23 and verse 14, it says, But in the prophets of Jerusalem I have seen a horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen the hands of evildoers so that no one turns from evil. All of them have become like Sodom to me and its inhabitants like Gomorrah. Now, some will make the argument that when it talks about committing adultery, that that's just talking about spiritual adultery, that they're teaching them to serve other gods. But when he uses the language of Sodom and Gomorrah, I don't think that's figurative language. I think he's talking there about the immorality that is going on in that particular day. And why are they doing all of this? Well, Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 13 for from the least to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. And from prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. What motivates a lot of this? Self-gain, self-interest. They are all about making a dollar. It's a lot easier to make a dollar when you tell people what they want to hear. Micah chapter 3, verse 11, its heads give judgment for a bribe, its priests teach for a price, its prophets practice divination for money. Yet they lean on the Lord. And what that means is they're invoking just enough biblical language that they can say, well, we're teaching, we're teaching God's truth. You know, um, one or two, you know, how, what does that look like today? That looks like one or two verses mixed with a bunch of fluff and nonsense. And so we see some of these same things today. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think that happens a lot. I think that happens a lot. 
think that's why it's really, really important that you, the guy who preached the truth while you're in the little building is still the guy who's preaching the truth when you're in the big building. Because that also happens from time to time. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we need to be careful about those things. What, what's motivating our teaching? What's motivating our words? Going with that, we, this really goes into this next point, which is that there is a lack of public moral courage. I think we've pretty well covered that. We've looked at the passages where they basically are just telling people what they want to hear. They're not going to speak up against the majority. They're not going to speak up against the people. They're not going to rock the boat, just going to go along to get along. What's the result of all of that? Go back to the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 13. Ezekiel chapter 13, <clears throat> verse 10, it says, Precisely because they have misled my people, saying, Peace, when there is no peace. Keep on going, verse 13, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will make a stormy wind break out in my wrath, and there shall be a deluge of rain in my anger, and great hailstones in wrath to make a full end. And I will break down the wall that you have smeared with whitewash and bring it down to the ground so that its foundation will be laid bare. Now, I think there's a couple of ways to interpret that prophecy. I think there is a literal interpretation because that really happened. But then also in a figurative sense, what happened to the people? What happened to the nation? They suffered with spiritual ruin. Go down to verses 22 and 23. Because you have disheartened the righteous falsely, although I have not grieved him, and you have encouraged the wicked that he should not turn from his evil way to save his life, therefore you shall see no more false visions, nor practice divination, I will deliver my people out of your hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. And so, we've got a lack of moral integrity. We've got a lack of moral courage. We've also got a lack of a prophetic mandate from God. What that means, that's just fa a fancy way of saying, you've got people saying, we're speaking for God, and God's saying, mm, no, you ain't. No, you're not. You're not speaking for me. Let's stay right here in Ezekiel chapter 13. Ezekiel chapter 13 and verse 6, They have seen false visions and lying divinations. They say, declares the Lord. But what else does the text say? They say, declares the Lord. That's their words, but what's their reality? Lord says, I haven't sent them. I haven't sent them, and I certainly haven't given them this message. Have you not seen a false vision and uttered a lying divination whenever you have said, declares the Lord, although I have not spoken? Now again, let's take that to modern day. What's the phraseology that we use in the churches of Christ? We are going to speak where the Bible speaks. But where the Bible is silent, we're going to be silent. And so that's essentially what God's saying here. He's saying, I haven't given you that. You've gone beyond the confines of what I have given. And so because of all of that, at the end of the chapter, he says, I'm not giving you anything. And so we need to be very, very cautious and careful when we say things like, the Lord spoke to me. How do you know? You've got to test it against the Word. It all goes back the word and if what God is allegedly giving you goes beyond the confines of the word guess what God didn't give it to you okay 
I mean, that should settle it. <laughs> and that is the conversation that we need to be having with a lot of people. When they say that, we can get into discussions and debates and, and about how the Spirit actually works, but here's, I think, a more effective approach. You just ask them, you say, okay, now you say God told you that, but, but that's not what God said in here. So how is God telling you something that he's not told us in here? And the answer is always going to be, he's not. He's not. Go ahead. 